pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the day that you have made. For those that have gathered here in this place, those that have gathered around the world in the name of Jesus, to worship you, to recognize how great, how great and awesome is our God. Bless us, Lord, as we turn to your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm not much of a game player. I don't like to play games. My wife likes to play games. And some board games, yeah. And 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 I always I always think when we're playing a board game, I could be doing something important. I could be doing something significant. And I always forget that, you know, it's communicating with your wife. It's having a good time together with your wife. Now now I like I like to watch games. As a matter of fact, um Dave and I have a reason to celebrate today, right? Because um, those of you that are great football fans, and we're football fans too, but but we're NASCAR fans. And this is the day. This is the Daytona 500, okay? Now, that's not a game. That's a sport, okay? And um, and it's entirely different. But, but games, so my wife decided that she was going to take it on as her task to teach me to play cribbage. And so... She's, yeah, that's the thing. that She's teaching me how to do this, how to play this, and I'm catching on little by little, more little though. And, um, and so one day she says, okay, now when you win a hand or when you're figuring up your points, if you miss any of your points, then the other person gets to take them. No, I'm not playing like that. No, no, I'm not doing that. And so, so my wife has learned a little bit here that sometimes she's got to give me a little bit of a do-over when it comes to counting up my points. She gives me that stern look. She doesn't even need to say anything. And I know that I didn't get it. Do-overs. We call them mulligans, right? You know where that comes from? There's actually two different stories out there about where the mulligan came from. There's probably more than that. David Mulligan back in the 20s was an American who went to Montreal, was playing golf, and he made a bad shot, and so he he um, told the guys he wanted another crack at it. He called it a correction shot, and um, and ever after that, allegedly, it became known by his name. A mulligan was a do-over. However, then there was Buddy Mulligan. I don't know how this uh, got arranged that there was two guys with the same name in the 1930s who convinced his two golf partners to allow him another shot after a bad shot because his two partners had been practicing all morning, and he hadn't had a chance to practice, and so because he took a bad shot he said hey wait a minute you guys were able to warm up I wasn't able to warm up and so it became known either either from David Mulligan or Buddy Mulligan the do-over a second chance at life a second chance at some incident some event that we've been involved in but you know what? we have our own version we don't call it Mulligans all the time but we have our own version of that we often wish that we could have a redo in life my goodness who doesn't wish they could have another crack at a lot of experiences in life you look back. You look back at that at that, um, that list of things that you don't often like to think about. So sometimes the devil comes along and reminds you of all your failings and your shortcomings. And oh my, do you ever wish that you could have a do-over on that? Or maybe you showed up to work, and on the way into work, it was just bad traffic, and there was an accident, and then you sat delayed, and you couldn't get there, and you had a meeting, you were supposed to be on time, and now you're late, and everybody's going to be upset. And you walk in, and you're just grouchy from the go, and somebody says something to you like, wow, you look nice today. You bite their head off. And then you look back and you say, oh, man, if I just had that to do over again. We, we oftentimes look at life like that. If I just had it to do over again. Or how about this? If I knew then what I know now, I could go back and live life over again and I could get it right. Don't we often think that? If I knew then what I know now, I could get it right. But you know what? You know what the truth of the matter is? No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You know why? Because we're human beings. We, we suffer from a fallen nature. We suffer from the flesh, from sin entering the world through the sin of one man, Adam. The problem in life is not what we do. The problem in life is what we are. What makes us do what we do, that's the problem. Not the lack of knowledge. Oh, if I only knew then, what I know now, and we conclude, knowledge is the answer to all my problems. If I had the knowledge. Yet how many of us, how many of us have knowingly made wrong choices, knowingly made wrong decisions? It's not that we lack knowledge. 
It's that we have a problem with who we are, our very nature, our fallen nature. Mark Twain once said, it's not what I don't know about the Bible that bothers me. It's what I do know. It's what I do know. Because he was struggling with the fact of not doing what he knew he should be doing. How like us is that? Paul was a Pharisee. And Paul, the Pharisee, wrote this. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual. I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, that's what I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I myself doing it, but it's sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, it doesn't dwell in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. That's my desire, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Romans 7. So Paul is a Pharisee. And I'm going to talk about Pharisees today. And this is kind of as we're, as we're making our way through the Gospel of John. We come to the third chapter now. And a Pharisee comes to Jesus by night. And it's important for us to understand a little bit about what Pharisees were all about. And, and we're going to be taking a look at that a little bit this week. And then next week, it helps us understand Nicodemus and the dilemma that Nicodemus had because he kept repeating to Jesus, how can these things be? And sometimes we look at that and we think, what is wrong with you, Nicodemus? Jesus is explaining it to you. But we don't understand the world in which he lived. We don't understand the culture in which he lived. We don't understand the, the rules. And, and, and all the, um, the conditions and all the requirements that were placed upon him. You, those of you that know me, you know that I'm an Old Testament scholar. And Nicodemus was an Old Testament man. Nicodemus was an Old Testament man, okay? Even though we've turned the page, we have Jesus coming onto the scene. Nicodemus is still living in the Old Testament. He's still living according to the understanding of the Pharisees um, in the Old Testament. And that's that's what we see um, in the Pharisaical life is a is a is an Old Testament mindset and basis and a lack of understanding of what God really intended to do through the person of Messiah, God's son, that was sent to the earth. So we have another Pharisee besides Paul. We have another Pharisee here. His name is Nicodemus, and he comes to Jesus by night. And he has some questions that he wants to ask. He comes with the same background as the Apostle Paul, one who memorized the entire Old Testament. It's always important for us to remember that, but children growing up in the, in the Jewish culture in Old Testament times memorized the entire Old Testament. They started out memorizing my favorite book, the book of Leviticus. And when they were done with the book of Leviticus, then they went and they memorized the rest of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But Leviticus was at the core, and that's why I so often tell you when I'm preaching and teaching my Bible studies, Leviticus is central to understanding all of the Bible. And, and so, so Nicodemus memorized that. When he was done with that, he went on. And he memorized the historical books and the poetry books and the prophetic books of the Old Testament. And he had it memorized from Genesis 1 through the end of um, Malachi. He understood what the Old Testament taught and said. Now, he didn't always understand the application of it, okay? But he had the same struggles that the Apostle Paul had. Because here's the law. And I'm trying to keep the law. And on the outside, as a Pharisee, I look good. And people look at me and they say, whoa, he's a Pharisee. He knows what the right thing is to do. He knows when to do things. He knows how to do things. He's a Pharisee. He's a righteous man. He's a holy man. But Nicodemus saw a part of himself that nobody else could see. Because Nicodemus could see his own heart. He could see the inside of himself. And the same disappointment that was supposed to make him holy, okay, the rules, the rules um, of the law, um, only revealed how wretched, how wretched he really was. He was disappointed with, 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 with the law of God that was supposed to be the guide for him. 
because it revealed to him how wretched he really was as the Apostle Paul wrote. In fact, Paul writes to us in the book of Galatians. That's exactly the intent of the law in the book of Romans as well. The intent of the law is not to make us holy, but to show us that we're not. I always, and I've used this illustration before, but I always like to describe the law as the mirror, the mirror that we look into. And all, all the law does is reveal the dirt that we have on our face, our need for cleansing. But it doesn't cleanse us. It doesn't make us holy. It doesn't make us clean. And so Jesus is going to introduce him, not to the redo, but to the renew. And Nicodemus is going to scratch his head. Be born again? What does that mean? To be born again? How can one be born again? So stand together with me and let's read our text for this morning. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Thank you. you may be seated. Now, I'm really only going to look at the first three verses of this, and next week we're going to go on. And I want to give an understanding next week of what it was that Nicodemus had in his mind when Jesus is saying you have to be born of water and of the Spirit. There's a lot of controversy among um, theologians as to what that means. And it's important for us to look back into the Old Testament and understand what a Pharisee had in his mind. And as he came to Jesus, and Jesus would have been talking about that, that is what we're going to take a look at next week. But I want us to see three different things that come out of this passage of Scripture here, these first three verses. Number one, the rules. Okay, the rules. It's important to understand the rules. It's always, always, always important to understand the rules. I remember when my wife died, and I came to the point where I was thinking about dating again, and Joy and I met and ended up getting married, somebody gave me a list of the rules, the rules for understanding women, the rules for dating. You guys, have you seen those? No, rule number one, the woman is always right. Rule number two, if the man ever thinks he's right, see rule number one. Okay, it, basically that's the rule, okay? Well, it's always important to understand the rules, the rules. And the Pharisees had many, many. But it's interesting that Nicodemus was a member of the ruling party. There's almost a play, a play on words there, not in the Greek, but there's certainly a play on words there for us in the English. Because a, a ruler, he was not only a man who kept the rules, but he was, he was one who was supposed to be ruling over the people. I want us to take a look at Nicodemus the man, Nicodemus the Pharisee, Nicodemus the man that quietly came to Jesus by night. And I want to enter a little bit into his world. Technically, a ruler is one who enforces the rules. That's what the Sanhedrin did. They were responsible for oversight of the Jewish people and an understanding of what the rules were. There was none, none better at rules than the Pharisees. They knew the rules. There was a group of them that did nothing but interpret the rules and, and uh, continually add to the understanding of what the rules were so that everybody, all the Pharisees, knew exactly what it meant to keep all the rules. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was, was a ruling body. It was like the board, okay? They oversaw um, all the religious aspect of Israel and the, the uh, Jewish people. He was a ruler, both a ruler over and a rule keeper. He was more of a rule keeper 
that he was a ruler over all the Pharisees were that way. It was it, Yes, it was about ruling, their administrative authority, but it was about rule, keeping, and always making sure that they were keeping the rules and doing the right thing so that they could please God. There were 70 Pharisees that were part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body. And they met every day, almost every day, not on the Sabbath, but they met regularly to discuss the, the events and the affairs of the Jewish people. There, there were never more than about 6,000 Pharisees in all, um, and out of those, then 70 of them were, were um, uh, on the, the board, so to speak. But the Pharisees, the 6,000 Pharisees, had taken an oath before three witnesses. It had to be witnessed by three men. And they had taken an oath to be keepers of the Ten Commandments. Every part of their life was centered around the Ten Commandments and what it meant to be keepers of the Ten Commandments. And so, they, they um, because there was always debate, there was always discussion. What does this commandment mean? Can I do this under this commandment? Can I do that under this commandment? They had an appointed group from um, from their, themselves that were called scribes. The scribes had the responsibility, they were like the rules committee, okay? They had the responsibility of sitting down, working together, and writing down the interpretation of the rules so that all the Pharisees understood this is what this rule means. So the scribes developed the Mishnah. The Mishnah was, was um, very, very thick. Book, as it were, um, and it contained all the explanation of the rules that related to the Ten Commandments, 24 chapters. Today, if you buy the Mishnah, it's a set of books. It's enormous. And, and there were 24 chapters on keeping the Sabbath, 24 chapters on what it meant to keep the Sabbath. Then that wasn't enough. And so they then collected the, what's called the Talmud. The Talmud is the commentaries on the Mishnah. So these are books written about what the Mishnah really means. And the Mishnah is written about what the Ten Commandments really mean. And it contains 156 pages dedicated just to keeping the Sabbath. 156 pages dedicated to what it means to keep the Sabbath. Well, whenever you have rules, you have loopholes. So the Pharisees were always looking at the rules, saying, okay, I want to be a rule keeper. I want to be a ruler. But what does that mean specifically? Let me give you a couple for instances on what they, what, what kinds of things they would do in all of these volumes written about the Ten Commandments, just on the Sabbath alone. One of the things they believed was that to tie a knot using two hands was work. Therefore, you could not tie a knot on the Sabbath day using two hands. Now, you could tie a knot using one hand, but you couldn't use two. So if you were a farmer and you had to tie a knot, or if you were a sailor and you had to tie a knot, and you needed to tie a knot on the Sabbath, you were out of luck unless you could do that with one hand. But, but, there had to be exceptions to rules because women, for instance, were required to wear a head covering, a shawl, and they had to tie that under their chin, and they couldn't tie it with one hand. Therefore, the scribes said, that women's shawls are exempt from the not tying rule. Also a woman's belt. So those were exempt. Therefore, if you needed to draw well water out of your well on the Sabbath, you could not use two hands to tie a rope onto a bucket and let it down into your well and draw it out. So what you did was you used the loophole. A shawl was exempt. So you tied the rope onto the shawl and the shawl onto the bucket, and then you were keeping the Sabbath. You could only walk a thousand yards in our, in our vernacular uh, from your house on the Sabbath. But what if you had to go further? So there's a couple of things that the Pharisees would do for loopholes. One is that if they walked quarter of a mile down the road and tied a rope 
onto a tree to signify the edge of their property, their border. Then the, the, the thousand yards didn't kick in until they got all the way down to wherever they tied the rope. That was very beneficial. Another thing that they did was they would plant little vegetable gardens all over the area, maybe all over the town that they lived in or around the countryside. And as long as it was your vegetable garden, it was considered part of your house, so your thousand-yard walk didn't begin until you got to your last vegetable garden, and then you were allowed to walk a thousand yards from there. So it was, it was a joke. It was rules upon rules upon rules with loopholes of all sorts. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, hey, I'm a member of the ruling council. I'm doing these things so that I might be righteous. But he didn't feel righteous. There was something lacking. There was something missing. It amazes me that Nicodemus even came to Jesus, that a Pharisee would even come to Jesus because Pharisees considered themselves superior to all others. And so the fact that he would come to Jesus by night and sit down and say, we need to talk. I need to know a little bit more about you and what it is that you're teaching. The Pharisees felt that they were superior, that they were superior to all others, superior in spiritual status and superior in understanding that it was all about learning. If they could just learn, if they could just know, then they could obey God, then they could be righteous, then they would be accepted by God. Maybe he came by night because it was unusual for a Pharisee to be coming to a rabbi like this. But he seemed to be representing others beside himself because it says, we know that you are a man sent from God. So it makes me wonder, who's the we? Is it the whole Sanhedrin, or is it he and some others from the Sanhedrin, most likely? But not only did he come, he came asking questions, driven by the fact that Jesus had performed miraculous signs. And he said, we know that you are a man sent by God because of the miraculous signs that you do. So there Nicodemus was scratching his head saying, God's got to be in this guy because look at what he's doing. But what are his rules? What are the rules that he's promoting? What is his way to God? And that leads me to the second thing I want to talk about. It's a the understanding of rabbis in Jesus' day. He, he called Jesus a rabbi. Rabbi, we know you are a teacher sent from God. A rabbi was a Jewish scholar or a teacher of the law. There were houses of rabbis or schools of thought, as it were. The reason I use the word houses is because a, a school of thought would be preceded by the word bet. Bet, like Bethel, house of God, Bethel, okay? So it was a house of the rabbi. And there was various different schools of thought, but there were two that, that were really prominent um, at this time that Nicodemus came to Jesus. It was the um, in the first century BC, two rabbis came along and they developed a unique and different school of thought. One was Bethel, and he was very lenient in his interpretation of the rules. The other was Bet Shammai, and he was very strict in his interpretation of the rules. And most everybody believed to one or other, or belonged to one or other of these schools of thought of the rabbis. Nicodemus, no doubt, did as well. A rabbinical house had a system of beliefs that was known as a yoke. As a rabbi, you had a yoke. The yoke was your system of beliefs. It was your teachings. And so it was often referred to as the yoke of a rabbi. And whether his yoke was lenient or whether his yoke was strict, but everybody knew that the rabbis had a yoke and that you came under their yoke if you agreed with their teaching. So Jesus' teaching didn't fit into either one of the major schools of the day, the current popular houses of thought. And Nicodemus scratches his head about that. And he says, I got to know more about this. Jesus was saying some strange things like, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Folks, a rabbi's yoke wasn't easy. A rabbi's yoke was not light. It was not a light burden. This was rules upon rules upon rules upon rules of what it meant to be righteous. So Bet Hillel and Bet Shemai 
even though one was lenient and one was strict, nevertheless, it was rules heaped upon rules, and it was not an easy thing to follow. But Jesus came along with a different kind of yoke, and that was certainly confusing to people. Peter agrees with this. Later on, we see in Acts chapter 15 and verse 10 at the, at the Council of Jerusalem when they're debating the Gentiles and whether the Gentiles need to be circumcised. And Peter stands up and he says, why do you test, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke? A yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. And Peter and Paul says the same thing. In Galatians, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. These are teachings. These are schools of thought. And so Nicodemus came to this rabbi and he inquired about his yoke. Nicodemus had been under a yoke and it didn't set him free. He'd been under a yoke and it didn't feel good. He'd been under a yoke, and it didn't make him feel righteous. It didn't make him feel clean. And we're going to, and this is going to make more sense to you next week as we look at Jesus saying that you need to be born of water and of the Spirit. But Nicodemus had been struggling as every Pharisee struggled with this. It didn't give him peace. Rules don't give you peace. It didn't give him joy. It didn't give him fulfillment. It didn't give him love. And yet he knew the Old Testament that says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind. But rules don't fill you with love. It's burdensome. This yoke had an appetite that could never be quenched. As soon as you thought that you had mastered all of the rules, the scribes would add a chapter to the rule book, and you found out there was more, more, more that you had to do. So that leads me to the third thing. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and he hears some radical news. Radical news. You see, questioning the teachers or scribes, Nicodemus came to this new teacher and said, we know you are a teacher has come from God. He's saying something very profound here. He's saying, you're not a teacher of the Pharisees. You're not a teacher who meets in the temple. You're not a teacher sitting down writing volumes and volumes of rules. We know that you're a teacher and that you are a teacher sent from God. And while John does not specifically tell us what Nicodemus is questioning, okay, to our Western contentment. I've explained many, many times that the Jewish thought is entirely different than the Western thought. You don't always have to ask the question like we ask it or answer it like we answer it. In the Jewish mind, there are implied questions that they understood. And when he, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he was coming to Jesus with the implied question, tell me about your yoke. Tell me about your teaching." I know that your teacher come from God, and the evidence is in what you do, the signs, the miraculous things that you have done. Tell me about your yoke, Rabbi. Tell me about your rules. What rules do I need to keep in order to enter God's kingdom? You know, isn't that a question that's at the heart of every person alive? What rules do I need to keep? Isn't that at the heart of all beliefs, every belief system in the world? What rules do I need to keep to be right with God? Man has always asked that question. Man will always ask that question. What does God expect of me? What does God want me to do? What kind of person does God want me to be? What do I need to do? What do I need to say? How do I need to act? What do I need to perform before God to be acceptable in his sight? Jesus had radical news, and he said, I tell you the truth. It's a very important phrase. Three times it comes out of this passage of Scripture. If those of us that grew up 
in the church with the old King James, we memorized verses that began, Verily, verily, I say unto thee. Remember that? Verily, verily. Well, the phrase that's translated here in the New International Version, I tell you the truth, is that same phrase, verily, verily, okay? Surely, surely, some translations have done true, truly, truly, or truthfully, truthfully, I tell you. And in the Greek, it's amen, amen. Now, we say amen at the end of our prayers. But the Jews used amen at the beginning or at the end, and depending on, and, and on where they used it, it changed the meaning. So at the end of a discourse or at the end of a prayer, it always meant so be it or let it be so, let it be fulfilled. That's if it comes at the end. So when I pray a prayer and I end it with amen in the Greek or amen, it means let this be so. Lord, may you fulfill what it is that I have asked of you. But when it comes at the beginning of a sentence, the beginning of a discourse, it means this is important, folks. This is absolute. This is sure and true. I like to think of it as Jesus looking at Nicodemus and saying, underline this. Sometimes I don't do it a lot in, in church, but in, in, um, in men's Bible study, a lot of times I'll say to the guys, you need to underline this. This is a verse you need to underline or highlight this. Or we could say, listen up. You ever say that to the youth, uh, Dylan? Listen up all the time, okay? That's amen, amen. In the future, just use amen, amen, and they'll understand, okay? Listen up. What I'm about to tell you is really important. Underline this. Get out your highlighter and highlight this, Nicodemus. So he begins with that. Surely, surely, verily, verily, amen, amen. This is going to be important for you. Three times Jesus does it in verse 3, verse 5, and verse 11. He begins each stage of his teaching with that statement. So what is the radical truth? Rules don't do it for you. Rules don't get you into God's kingdom. Next week. I'm going to show, show us from the book of Ezekiel a teaching that the rabbis ran around with. And, and they believed if they did this and they did this, that Messiah would come. And they thought that they had done this and they thought that they had done this. And it's one of the reasons that Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night because knowing that the, the, the Pharisees had done the first two things, they expected Messiah to be there. And could it be, could it be that this rabbi is in fact Messiah? I'll get into that more next week from Ezekiel chapter 37. But, but Jesus is saying, here's the radical truth. It's not the rules. The rules don't get you into the kingdom of heaven. self Righteous acts don't cut it. I don't care how far you walk from your house. I don't care if you tie a knot with two hands, one hand, or if you use your wife's scarf, scarf or belt. That has nothing to do with entering the kingdom of heaven. It has nothing to do with whether you belong to God. It has nothing to do with whether you're righteous, whether you're holy, whether you're acceptable to God. It's not about you. Oh, how we struggle with that. Even as believers, we struggle with that. We struggle with who we are. We struggle with our nature. We struggle with the, 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 the deep, dark resources of our innermost being. We know us better than anybody else knows us. Thank the Lord. Nobody else knows this about me, but I know it about me, and I don't like it. The dark shadows of my inner person, my past, maybe my secret present. And I'm not, I'm not setting those things aside that need to be dealt with and, and, and the Lord needs to give you victory over in your life. But what I'm telling you is you can get rid of everything that you don't like about you and it isn't going to change who you are. Because who we are in God's kingdom doesn't have anything to do with who we are. It has to do with who he is. It has to do with what he has done. It has to do with the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary it has to do with that one word, tetelestai. I. It is paid in full, Father. It is paid in full. So no matter what you do, you still are what you are. My friend Leonard over here, I didn't ask you if I could use your name, but I did. Too late. Told me last week, he said, you know, there just is no perfect church out there. And I told him, I found one one time, and then I started going. <laughs> That's the problem. That's the problem. Wherever I am, I'm there. No matter what you do, you still are what you are in the flesh. Paul writes, if I give all 
that I have to the poor. And this is my translation. This is the RSV, the Russell Sports version. If I, give, if I give all I have to the poor and I don't change who I am, I gain nothing. I can tithe all my money. I can give everything I have. I can love everybody. I can drop everything. I can do, 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 do to help other people. It doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change who I am. People can look at me and say, well, man, he's so cool. He's just always willing to help out. He's so loving. He's so caring. He's so kind. But it doesn't change who I am. Still, man, with a fallen nature because of the sin of Adam. Isaiah says, all my righteousness, all my righteous attempts are no more than an offering of filthy rags to God. That's the best I have to offer. It's an old filthy rag. It's the best I have. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Underline this, highlight this, Nicodemus. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Born again? Born again? What kind of radical teaching is that? Jesus is looking at this Pharisee, and this Pharisee believes really that, number one, he needs to be washed clean by God, and number two, that he needs to be he needs to be covered in the Spirit of God. Again, we'll look at that next week. But now, now this rabbi comes along and says, No, no, you need to be born again. Now we use that phrase, born again. As a matter of fact, I hear it all the time. Um, I'm a NASCAR fan. I've heard it on NASCAR, okay? A driver that wasn't doing very well, and then all of a sudden he was born again, okay? Um, Tiger Woods, the golfer, okay? Now he's out for now because of problems, all kinds of medical problems. But I, I but he, he's over the, over the years, he's developed a new swing. And then a few years later, another new swing. And then a few years later, another new swing. He was a born again golfer. We use that phrase for all kinds of things. The world uses it. You don't have to be a Christian to use the word born again. People use it. Born again. Born is from the Greek gneo. It means, and notice the word, you can kind of see it in there, the word genes. We get the English word genes from gneo. And it means to get your genes from. So Jesus is saying you need to be born. You need to get genes from. And then he says, I know that, I know that, the Greek word, from above. From above. Boy, do I like that. Sometimes it's hard to explain what born again means. But Jesus is saying you need to get your genes from above. Who you are needs to come from God. Who you are doesn't come from your rules. Who you are doesn't come from getting a second chance at life. Who you are doesn't come from the Mishnah, doesn't come from the scribes, it doesn't come from how far you walked on a Sunday or a Saturday, a Sabbath. Who you are has to come from above. God's got to make you new. It's not a matter of a redo, it's a matter of a renew. And that's why the Apostle Paul talks about in Jesus Christ, we're a new creation. In the Greek, the word new means new in the form that never existed before. Jesus Christ, we're new creations. We're new. We're not a makeover. We're a renew in Jesus Christ. Born from above. You see, I know that it has three meanings to it. Number one means a second time. Number two, to radically and completely begin anew. And number three, from above. And Jesus has all three of them tied together here. He's saying you need to get your genes. You need to get your essence. You need to get your spirit. You need to get your soul. Your nephesh, the breath of God in you. You need to get that from God, a second birth, a radical and completely new birth, and it comes from above, not from your actions. He has to do the work in us. It's not our actions. It's not a reference. It's God's work. Let's be born a second time. Being radically, completely made new by God's transforming power, folks. Sometimes we come to these points in life and we just say, I can't conquer it. I can't overcome it. I can't get a handle on it. It's God's transforming power that makes a difference. So God
God's transforming power that sets us free. And here's what I want you to understand. You get to make no contribution to the work of God. You get to make no contribution. See, that's what the Christian life is all about. To receive. And not to contribute. Now hold on. Because I'm going to have an exception to that because Pharisees always have an exception, right? Believe that God is. Believe that God is. That God is real. That God is powerful. That God is creator. That God is everywhere present. God knows your every thought. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made by him. Believe that God is. Believe that God's word is true. Believe that God sent his son to shed his blood and die for you because you're a sinner by birth. And believe that everything that God requires is provided for you by Jesus. Except one thing. You ever thought about this? Everything that God requires of you is provided by Jesus. Except one thing. That's the yoke of the rabbi. That's the yoke of Jesus. That's what Nicodemus was confused about when he came by night. We're going to go deeper into this next week. But the rabbis had these extensive yokes. The Pharisees, the scribes, their rules upon rules. And Jesus, in John 3, 16, For God so loved you, Nicodemus, that he gave his only son, his one and only son, and if you believe, that's all you need to do. And you'll have eternal life. That's my contribution. Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all. And being born again means getting my nature from above. God do it in me. God lay hold of me. God transform me. God, I don't want to redo. I want to redo. I don't want to be the old man trying to do it over. I want to be a new man, set free from the old man, with you living your life in me. And so the man came to Jesus by night. The man who was the man of rules, confined to the yoke of the rabbi, who gave him a radical teaching, he surrendered. Let him make you into the man, woman, or person that he has ordained you to be. Radical to a Pharisee. Radical. I mean, there's got to be more. There's got to be no, no, there's not Nicodemus. That's all there is. Believe. Receive. I don't know every person here. And even if I do know you, I don't know your innermost being. But if you've never been transformed by Jesus Christ, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to know that I'm going to be part of the kingdom of heaven when I die and go to heaven? What does that mean? It means believe. Believe in everything. magic words. There's no magic formula. It's Lord, I believe. Nicodemus, we don't have it in this chapter, but he did believe it. He did. And he becomes a great man of God. We see him in the death of Jesus, caring for the body, the one he loves so much. Believe. You let God change you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. As we begin this incredible chapter in John, 
minus it is only one rule. It's not even a rule. Because your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. You did it for us.